and it's recording. All right, um, this is Ross Wolf of the Platypus Affiliated Society, um, interviewing Boris Groys, uh, professor of uh, literature and, and, and art. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, my official title is professor of Russian oh. and Slavic uh, studies here. Cool. Um, we're going to be talking about um, Professor Groys's book on uh, communism, the communist postscript. Uh, originally written and published in 2006 in German and translated uh, and released by Verso Press uh, later, um, as well as some of his writings on art uh, and the avant-garde and Stalinism. In the introduction to your 2006 book, The Communist Postscript, you provocatively assert, and this is a quote, the communist revolution is the transcription of society from the medium of money to the medium of language. It is a linguistic turn at the level of social practice, or praxis, end quote. We'll return to this claim in a moment. For now, I might ask the inverse. What do you make of the, of the communist turn in the language of contemporary left discourse uh, by figures such as Badu, uh, Zizek, Bastille, Dean, etc.? What's the significance of this sort of return to communism? Well, uh... It doesn't seem to me that uh, any return actually happened, you know, because, um, uh, you know, if you were speaking now uh, about the West, you know, not, not, not the East, but about the West, yeah, um, then we always have communist parties in the West, French Communist Party, Italian Communist Party, every European nation had a Communist Party, actually. Uh, during and after uh, the Cold War. So I, I would rather speak about a certain kind of migration of this discourse, yeah, from, let's say, the framework of mass parties, like Communist Party and Communist apparatuses, uh, that um, became inefficient, partially disillusioned, uh, partially a uh, loss uh, influence and power inside the political structure of the European societies. And though uh, we have some um, groups of intellectuals that uh, began to assert the hegemony uh, yeah, over this kind of discourse that slipped away uh, from the communist parties. Okay, so I, I guess to, to just specify, um, in terms of this sort of intellectual migration um, in the post-1989 moment in the West, um, obviously somebody like uh, Slavoj Žižek uh, did live under um, uh, what we would consider actually existing socialism uh, in the East, uh, not specifically Soviet socialism, but Eastern Bloc. Um, but the rest of the authors, Bastille, Spadu, Dean, um, while they may have been involved with various Marxist communist parties, um, never lived under a regime uh, that identified itself as Marxist or uh, adhering to some sort of Marxist doctrine. Um, do you feel like the, um, the migration to reassert the, the idea of communism or the communist hypothesis that Baju has, um, is it all indicative of uh, post-communist, as in post-1989 discontents with capitalism that, that remain? No, I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say so because I think we should not underestimate the influence of the communist parties and the intellectual institutional power of the communist party, uh, parties, especially in France and Italy uh, during the Cold War. Of course, uh, we don't speak there about uh, socialist regimes like in the East. Still, Communist Party and Communist Party apparatus and Communist press uh, was very influential in the intellectual life of France and Italy for a very long time. Uh, and then if we look at the um, trajectories of uh, intellectual trajectories 
of different uh, you know, uh, influential figures in a French, uh, speaks specifically about the French situation, in the French intellectual life from Sartre uh, through Foucault and, and uh, Derrida and so on and so on. All of them, one, uh, one way or another, yeah, defines a, a, a position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Communist Party in the first place, yeah. uh, much more than in a relationship to, the, to capitalism or whatever form uh, we can speak about it. And so, uh, if you look at the uh, you know, uh, intellectual career of Badiou, for example, he began uh, with a kind of Sartrean you know, connection and then with a kind of uh, Maoist infatuation, yeah, very early in the 60s. Mm -hmm. So already at that time, many, many years ago, decades ago, his goal was a kind of constant, uh, a, a kind of revolt against uh, communist uh, party domination in France. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the Maoist movement and many other movements at that time were actually directed against the leading role of the Communist Party in the first place. And everything that we can read now about uh, from him and many other people uh, is related actually to this very early experience of French Maoism, very early experience of the mm -hmm. 60s, and uh, what they experienced as betrayal of this movement by the Communist Party. At the same time, the movement itself, from the beginning, was directed against the Communist Party. So, uh, we can argue what happened in different ways, but uh, my impression is that we have now the continuation of a contestation yeah, of the Communist Party domination in the interpretation of what communism is, yeah, that started much, much earlier, that started in the 60s. So, now as a Communist Party, uh, a Communist Party everywhere is down. Uh, this discourse remained as only one. Yeah? So the discourse that started historically as directed against the hegemony, intellectual hegemony, cultural hegemony of the French Communist Party in a French intellectual culture life now functions uh, as a leading communist discourse. Yeah? That is a very paradoxical situation. There's also it the was originally mm -hmm. an anti-communist discourse, if you want. It was anti-communist discourse because it was directed against the Communist Party. That was at that time the avatar, the embodiment of the communist idea. But it happens in history time and again that anti- uh, institutional discourse begins when the time goes on, actually replaces this institutional discourse. I would, if you want, yeah, I would um, compare but usually all these people uh, with the uh, earlier European Protestant movements. Yeah. Early European Protestant movements were directed against the Catholic Church. Yeah, it was a constitution of a right of the church to dictate the interpretation of Christianity. Okay? They took this interpretation of the Christianity in their own hands. Yeah? And after some countries, like for example Germany, uh, Holland, many others, um, Catholic Church went down, the Protestant Church and the Protestant movement remained as only as dominating. Uh, embodiments of presentational spaces for uh, for the uh, for Christianity, and the same happens now. Yeah, so they began very early. They struggle against the institutional interpretation of communism, and now after the institutions uh, uh, decayed in one way or another, they have this leading role. That can be said about many. You know, oppositional movements in history. It's not new. Mm. Mm. There's also the, I mean, I don't want to focus too much on Padu, but um, there is the interpolation of uh, 
of Althusser, who was, by contrast, at least involved in the orthodoxy of the French Communist Party. So, while while Badiou did have this sort of Sartrean trajectory yeah. that you mentioned, he also had the anti-humanist influence that he and others like Zizek also used to negotiate uh, their position within Marxist discourse. That's true. But of course, Althusser was also uh, a kind of dissident, uh, loyal dissident, yeah, and so the communist world. So I think what um, uh, what maybe uh, is the difference between my position and their position is that for this or that uh, political and ideological reason, I was and still is very much interested in the institutional side of the things. So I'm interested in the institutions and official traditions. So I, I don't believe that we uh, can speak about the communism, about the communist today, saying everything institutional, institutionalized, was not communism. Yeah, like Protestant said that the Catholic Church is a church of the Satan. Yeah, okay. So it's not real Christianity. It's all the same. All these, you know, decades and centuries of communist movements, that was not real communism. Communism begins with us. It is a claim that one can understand and one can find nice. But it is a claim that seems to me to be historically, ideologically, politically, Philosophically, a bit problematic. Mm. Even in the case of Zizek, I mean, in, in the case of all of them. Because all of them say we start anew. Yeah? We reject everything that was before. We don't correct it, we don't interpret it, we just reject it as a kind of fundamental failure. Yeah? At something that was not real communism. Like Luther said, no, the whole Roman Catholic Church is a work of Satan. It's not really Christian. Yeah. I would say Stalin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Stalin. It's all the work of Stalin. <laughs> all the work of Stalin. It's satanic. It's bad. It's evil. Yeah? That is not real communism. So we know what the real communism is because what? And then there is a certain uh, difference between, I would say, uh, between position of Zizek uh, and Vladimir uh, and the very similar position of Luther Calvin on the other hand. Because Luther Calvin had something that Vladimir and Zizek, as it seems to me, do not have direct relationship to God. Yeah? So if you are a Christian believer, then you can believe, or you almost must believe, that as an individual, you have a direct relationship to God, not mediated by any kind of hierarchy, any kind of official ideology, any kind of institution. But if you repeat this gesture of uh, Protestantism under the condition of secularism, it means to be problematic because how I can, as an individual, as a thinker, have a direct, unmediated access to the historical process, access to the idea of communism, so that what itself mm -hmm. is religious, yeah? A religious idea of communism <laughs> is idealistic, so to say, is in itself already uh, exclude the possibility of materialistic, non-materialistic, not religiously infected, you know, uh, dealing with the problem. So um, the concept of direct Sartrean existential Maoist unmediated uh, contact with energies, desires, you know, that is also a delusion effect, but infection. Yeah. This kind of inner intensity, this kind of energy, this kind of unmediated understanding of what 
communist energy desire is without any institution dissolving, tradition dissolved, any party without this dissolved, you know, directly, individually, as, as one person, as one individual. That is very romantic, uh, almost religious, mystical uh, approach, you know? Because, of course, Marxism and the Marxist tradition has something to do with this mediation, yeah? something mm -hmm. to do with this disbelief in the possibility of this direct, direct grasp yeah? of something like an idea of communism, desire of communism, I don't know, historical energy or whatever. Mm -hmm. I guess related to this question of uh, idea in the sort of Platonic sense, idealism, uh, as a broader philosophical tradition, uh, like Alain Badu, you see a continuity between the communist project and philosophical Platonism, despite the fact that, as with your more recent uh, introduction to anti-philosophy, you appear to have arrived at this conclusion of this term uh, independently, uh, on your own. But you write that uh, communism, uh, this is a quote, communism stands in the Platonic tradition, it is a modern form of Platonism in practice, end quote. So while you specify communism as a modern form, you believe its central tenets uh, stretch all the way back to antiquity, specifically Plato. What is specifically uh, modern about communism? How is it distinguished from its ancient precursor uh, in the philosophy of Plato? I think that uh, for understanding what I want to say, uh, I have to add what I do from the beginning, how I understand Platonism, not as a grasping of the ideas, yeah, the traditional way, but as a demonstration of the impossibility of any insight. So Platonism, culmination of Platonism, is um, Socratic dialogues that actually demonstrates the impossibility for a human being to grasp the ideas. Yeah? So all, all, all the kind of the uh, all the kind of argumentation collapses at some point in time, and that is actually the place of power. Right? The place of power is is a moment and is a space of this collapse. Right? So uh, if you look at the Platonic state and concept of Platonic state, then the philosopher, uh, the philosopher ruler. Yeah? is somebody who actually manage and administer this space of collapse of any kind of individual design and in, in, in individual design for truth. Now, that, that was, uh, communism actually was historically, yeah, I could say it. Uh, what was more than about that? Uh, almost nothing, I would say, um, in a certain way, yeah. Well, we can speak, of course, uh, about the communism a specific form of industrial society, and this is uh, uh, that would sound very modern, and it is also true. And mm -hmm. way. But I think what was important about uh, Soviet communism specifically, but also all the metastars of Soviet communism, like uh, Western communist parties, was this experience which is made a modern experience only in a sense that all the modern society, contemporary society, begin to experience that on a very big scale, uh, at the scale of the It is the impossibility to come to the, any kind of social consensus. Yeah? We are living in a society that is split uh, in a way that's so, so obvious that we do not believe anymore at the possibility of any uh, democracy, any liberal perspective, because we can't believe uh, in a possibility of uh, consensus, yeah, which is traditional basis of democracy. If you look at the contemporary American society, look at any contemporary society, there are so fundamentally split, so fundamentally fragmented, uh, so fundamentally uh, uh, incapable yeah, to come to any consensus, 
Now this is why they can't be administered, but they can't be brought to any kind of social politics. But social politics is not possible. And this kind of administration yeah, of these societies beyond without consensus is in the West administration through economy. So they are administered through economy. So even there is uh, no uh, mutual understanding, common understanding with everybody. Understand this common understanding is impossible, and cons uh, societal con uh, consensus is impossible. The unity of the society and functioning of society is uh, guaranteed by the participation of the economy. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the economy in the Western sense and the market, yeah, the market, yeah, ultimately was abolished by the Bolsheviks, and so instead of uh, the economy, you have uh, emergence of certain kind of administrative power that practice a language beyond consensus. And this kind of phenomenon of language beyond consensus is precisely what you can find in a very refined form in Platonic dialogues. The philosopher is somebody who managed the uh, language beyond consensus, and that was actually made on the uh, mass level. So I think what what is more than about um, Platonic problematics is that it became uh, urgent, it became political, it became problematic of society as a whole, uh, instead of being a very you know, elite problematic of small group of uh, you know, Greek intellectuals on the agora. Yeah, I mean, so the Platonism that you're invoking is the one usually associated with uh, the Socratic ethical dialogues, where they reach a sort of aporia or mm -hmm. impasse, uh, paradox, as yeah. you put it. Um, but also, I mean, you you talk about the sort of manager philosoph philosopher who kind of contains this paradox, almost in the way that um, the later Platonic dialogues tend towards monologue where it's just the philosopher expounding metaphysically. Um, so it seems to be... It's not good, <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I, what, what I take from the, from the late plot is not this kind of, uh, you know, monological, uh, monological uh, uh, presentation of certain kind of uh, new mythology. Uh, mm -hmm. To me, develops, Yeah, develops as a new plot and, and, and actually becomes more and more mystical and mythological by time. What I mean is this uh, project in his state, the Republic I think it is uh, translated, but it's not Republic of course. The state uh, that is administered by philosophers through occasional apply application of violence, uh, beyond uh, consensus, because he understands at that time the consensus is impossible. So I think that uh, both capitalism and communism, in its Eastern European form, was an answer to the insight that the bourgeois uh, French revolutionary dream of reaching something like a basic, uh, basic consensus, the possibility of mutual understanding and coming to the mutual, uh, to the politics, consensual politics, that this kind of dream collapsed. And this kind of dream collapsed with Marx, already collapsed further with Nietzsche, so with understanding that there are conflicts, economic conflicts, class conflicts, and many other conflicts, that on a very fundamental basis make uh, any consensual politics impossible. So if there is no consensual politics impossible, if we have nothing com in common, okay, then how we, how we can have said beyond this bourgeois dream? Yes, as far as you speak about commonalities and go the common, you remain on the level of reflection, which is fundamentally pre-Marxist. Yeah? If you want to 
speak after Mars, after Nietzsche, after Freud. You have to speak about society that has no common ground, and not a skillful concept. What to do with that? Okay, I mean, I think this ties in with, with that. Um, especially uh, related to the question of communism's modernity, as opposed to just philosophical Platonism of antiquity, this seems to be the intermediate stage of capital. Here we might return to the argument uh, that we just cited at the beginning of the interview, in which you trace the shift from what you call the medium of money under capitalism to the medium of language mm -hmm. under communism. You draw a conceptual distinction between uh, the philosophical paradox in which uh, both A and not A are asserted simultaneously uh, in contradiction, which is held up as an impasse, uh, which you believe belongs to language, the logos, um, versus uh, what's translated at least as an economic compromise, yeah. which seems to be the equivalence of A and not A. Yeah. I don't know if it's a matter of translation, but is this, uh, I mean, this, and this belongs to money, basically equivalence, the universal equivalent that Marx talked about. Um, it was it, way, yeah. Is the economic compromise that you describe at all related to the, the equivalence or the commensurability outlined in the first chapter of Marx's Capital? If the underlying ground for the uh, equivalence of unequal items, like, you know, uh, ten pairs of shoes at a table, um, is homogeneous abstract labor time, or value, might the modernity that, that is described, the sort of uh, hegemony of this value form, uh, not be related to, and, and may what distinguishes communism from Platonism be this sort of intermediate stage of capital? Is that is capitalism the sort of modernity to which, or out of which, uh, communism arises? Well, but uh, speaking about this kind of, uh, yeah, whatever uh, you mentioned, uh, I don't speak about, uh, I don't speak about uh, commodities and things like that. I speak about something different. I speak about social position ideologies. That, that, that was and the fact that social position ideologies under the current system of capitalism uh, have certain value. They have certain value. And people pay, people have paid for having them. Yeah? And they are paid out of them. So what what do I mean? I mean that for example I don't know. L l l l look at any any example. Look at example of uh, current example of uh, discussion among uh, Republican Party. I don't know the Demo Democratic Party in 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 in, a, in a, uh, USA. Yeah. Okay. So Republicans do not want so much social state, and Democrats want a bit more social state. You know. So they have basic philosophical differences. They have basic philosophical differences uh, between two visions of society. Okay. These two visions are irreconcilable, yeah? so they, they don't have common ground. And there's absolutely no possibility to mediate them, there's no possibility to, con to consensus. Yeah? They are two different. Okay. So what happens under American system? In one way or another, that at this point, the Republican Party becomes so much money from the budget, and the Democratic Party becomes so much money from the budget, and that's it. Okay? So the ideologies have a price, have a value. Republicans are paid for being silent, democratic are paid for being silent, everybody gets each part of the budget and they are reconciled on that level until the next uh, controversy. So that's what you mean by compromise. That's what I mean by compromise. 
And what I mean by compromise, that economic compromise. So um, uh, Western system, Western economic system works always in the same way. If you have a certain kind of opinion and a certain kind of politics, you are paid for not to practice it to a certain degree. For example, you are a communist and you are you have a communist idea, yeah? Okay. So you become a professor, you uh, you are you are publishing, you organize a certain kind of association, you you get a certain funding, you get a certain income, and that keeps you still, yeah. If no, nobody says it's bad. Nobody argue against you, no, nobody argues for you. It's obvious that there's no consensus possible on the basis of your opinions, but you are paid for having them. Yeah? It has nothing, and everybody who has whatever opinions in the Western society is paid for having them. Yeah? And in this way, becomes a part of the, uh, of the um, whole economy system without any claim to be a part of the societal consensus. What would be Stalinist politics if Stalin would be confronted with a, a Republican and Democratic controversy? He would shoot all the uh, members, members of the Tea Party Okay. <laughs> he would shoot all the um, extreme liberals, yeah, if they are, they are not there, probably. But if they would be, probably, the, I don't know, Chomsky. Maybe not. Chomsky? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> and um, everybody would be happy, yeah? because at the moment you eliminate the extreme position. Yeah, extreme left and extreme right. Everybody else can't live with, with a failure. Can't live with the insight in the inner impossibility of one's own, uh, one's own uh, ideology, on one's own truth. Yeah? So capitalism and socialist system Stalin system, let's say, yeah, Stalin system, is, uh, are two ways to manage and administer um, uh, the frustra ideological frustration. Yeah? And inside, in the impossibility to achieve a consensus on the basis of your, your truth, or what you call, and actually the social truth in general. It's uh, in Western you are paid for that, and in 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 the Stalin system you are integrated in a system of frustration, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. in a, in administration of frustration. Now, but you have to understand if you speak about modernity of uh, of that problem, you have to look into uh, I don't know writings of Rousseau, Voltaire, Locke, even Hume. So if you look at the uh, intellectual landscape before the French Revolution and even after the French Revolution until Marx, yeah, even the Hegelian right and left, you find this kind of hope for a consensual politics and for consensual ideology. You find belief in the in in nature of truth, in the divine truth, in the common truth, in a truth that can be reached at the end of history, you, you have this hope that your desire for consensual truth can be now, early, later, at some point in time, satisfied. Then Marx starts a new period in political thinking that is based on the insight that this satisfaction is impossible. Yeah? You have class struggle against the consensual policy and inside, instead of consensual policy. So con consensus and common truths are impossible. So how you manage that? 
And we have two models to manage that. One model is uh, market, and the other model is social administration. Yeah, They are controlled by the same problem, and they manage the same problem in two different ways. So the state and the market? Or is the state and the market. With the state being socialism and the market being capitalism. And the market being, being capitalism, yeah. But, um, well, only state, um, like socialist state, so state that is liberated from the market, yeah, the, mar the, 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 the capitalist state. Is Where the market is subordinated. Market, yeah, market or, or is subordinated or, or eliminated. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, other conditional business society, we have subordination of the state to the market. And this, this whole uh, discussion about the budget, so how I how much money I, I, I get from my convictions to abandon them, yeah, that is, that is a whole discussion is about that, yeah. It, and that the only discussion that, that is, uh, that you find with the society, yeah. The only dis political discussion is how what I will be paid for abandoning my convictions, yeah. It's 2%, it's 1%, it's 3.5%, yeah. And that was just happening. Yeah? Okay. Well, that is a problem. And then, if every, everybody is paid, everybody rejects an abundance of conviction, and you have a social peace. Well, that is the best model, and that is the model that I try to describe. Yeah? The Eastern model was uh, the state that takes the role of manager and in instance of frustration. Yeah, what, what the Stalin state was. It was a machine of frustration of everybody uh, and under the exclusion of possibility of achieving the truth. What is the Western market? It's the same. It's a machine for frustration of everybody. Everybody knows that whatever he says, nothing comes out of it, only a few. I guess. Um just, I mean, in terms of Platypus's own engagements, one of the central questions we've usually asked uh, the various authors within this, uh, within this uh, books on these books on communism published by Verso, is whether or not Marx is an irreducible figure to communism. Obviously, there were pre-Marxist forms of communism advocated by Saint-Simon or Fouquier or, and Proudhon. And there were later non-Marxist uh, anarchist uh, uh, developments or articulations of an idea of communism. But I guess I, I think that the qu a question to direct to you would be different. Um, not the irreducibility of Marx, but the irreducibility of Stalin. Uh, I, I would say both. Irreducibility of Marx, I already answered this question. In fact, I only summarize that in two sentences. All these people you mentioned, so on and so on, so on all, the, uh, uh, all the programs were based on the, uh, on the possibility of consensus. And the possibility of common inspired for the society that life as it is is bad and can be changed for good. Yeah? Okay. Marx uh, puts a point to that. Yeah? He doesn't believe in such possibility. He doesn't believe that society can be changed from bad to good. He believes in a struggle that is irreducible, in an impossibility of common understanding because of the difference of class and trust. And he's basically anti-utopian. So Marx is somebody who completely excludes the possibility of something like a common event, yeah? common desire, and whatever you can hear and I hear from time to time from the French culture and media also today. Yeah? And it's more free and sensible. And the other things, and this, you know, let us, let us understand that it's better to do something good as to do something bad. Because to do something bad is bad, and to do something good is bad. Did they not believe in a, did 
Did Marx not believe in the possibility, of, eventually, though, of a classless society? Uh, yeah, but only, only after all other classes were suppressed. And it is uh, potentially uh, infinite, uh, infinite, uh, uh, infinite uh, procession of events because the traditional communist ideal, the traditional uh, utopian ideal is based on the possibility of all classes and all populace, whole population as it is to proceed to you uh, through inside in the social truth, to proceed to a new form of society. Marx says it's not possible. You have to start a war inside society. You have to go to the class trial. You have to suppress a part of society and destroy it. Then it is possible for the remaining part of society to organize a class society. Okay, so this class society cannot include huge part of society as it is, it should be destroyed. Okay. After it happens, and how it happens, we, we can take, uh, we can uh, formulate the question how long it takes. Yeah. And the question how long it takes, and how you decide class interest, and how you uh, define class division of society, is it, it is a question that is a Stalinist question, of course. The Stalinist question is, of course, it's a question of uncertainty of class society, uh, of class structure of the social society. Yeah? On the one hand, classical classes, classes are away. On the other hand, uh, new classes arise, yeah? a new class, uh, new inequalities, uh, new tensions, and so on and so on. And so you are confronted with new uh, problems uh, emerging from that. So classless society is not something that, and that is Stalinist inside, it's not something that emerges immediately, spontaneously, and necessarily after the abolition of the class system as it is here. Yeah. The society that comes after the revolution it's also a society that should be managed. It's all society that creates its own inequalities. And the question is how you deal with them. So, in, but I think that um, uh, Marx starts uh, a discourse of impossibility, as I said, of all inside. And everything else is comes out of it, yeah? Mm -hmm. so, as, as far as you believe that there is something, an event, a desire, an energy, uh, absolute spirit or whatever that unites society as it is, yeah, you are thinking pre-Marxist. If you are going to think post-Marxist, you have to think about society as being irreparably and irreversibly divided. Yeah? And this kind of, and the question is how you manage this division, how you operate under the, uh, under the assumption uh, or reality uh, of this irreparable division. That is post marxist mm -hmm. problem. So is, so would you say that, that Marx is the necessary condition or presupposition for the, the sort of condition of possibility for communism? and? Would then, on the other hand, you say that Stalin is the necessary outcome? No, I don't say all of that, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, there is one answer to this question. I think that Marx, and I would say Nietzsche after him and some other people after him, but Nietzsche for sure, uh, Marx for sure, formulates for the first time and its point of no return this question how I can practice politics under the condition of radical, irreparable uh, division in the society without any hope 
of any uh, commonality. Okay. And then we have different answers to some. Some is one the answer to this question. Is it mm, plausible answer? Yes. He understand. Is it likable answer? No, <laughs> it's not. But it's, it, it is an answer that can be ignored. I'm sure, and I believe that there could be a different answer. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And we're looking for that answer. Yeah? I don't believe that the market is an answer. I don't believe that Stalin is an answer. Uh, that I would prefer. But I also don't believe that the answer is any answer that ignores the question and the radicality of this question. A sort of irresolvable paradox. Yeah. That sort of, I mean, the paradox, though, presumes that class antagonism would still, or the, the antagonisms of inequality would still. The, the paradox is that how to practice common politics in a society without common rights. I see. Um, that is a question, that paradoxical question, because the answer, you cannot, but at the same time, you have to. Mm -hmm. And so, that, 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 if you want, a modern, even maybe postmodern, postmodern question. Yeah. I guess, I think I'd like to use that to segue, kind of shift gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned, uh, toward the beginning of your book, uh, Going Public, um, that the period of modernity is uh, the period in which we still live. Yeah. And you outline it roughly from, uh, at least theoretically or philosophically, as uh, stemming around uh, Kant's critique of judgment from 1790. Obviously, this sort of political correlate would be 1789, the French Revolution, etc. With this series uh, of panels on art, one of the questions that we um, are interested in is the question of periodization. You, you mentioned, you write that uh, modernity is the period in which we still live. I guess the, the problem uh, arises, uh, and I'm interested in how you understand the problem to be resolved or how it works, uh, is, you know, are we still, or were we ever, postmodern? If so, how does this relate to the modernity that that we still live under? That you explain, like what what is the character or the relationship of postmodernity to modernity, and are we approaching perhaps a sort of end to postmodernity, a sort of post postmodernism? Well, I. Uh... I also speak about postmodernity in my writings and so on and so on because I, I know that people use this word and think that they understand this word and so I use it too. But I don't believe that anything like that ever happened. I don't believe that, I personally don't believe that postmodernity as a word had any meaning, yeah, or still has any meaning, and the postmodern has any meaning, and so on and so on. I think that what generally happens, and that is modernity, yeah, I again come, come to the same point that the, we don't believe in God, we don't believe in reason, we don't believe in progress, and people think that postmodernity doesn't believe in progress. Nobody in the 19th century, if it was, uh, if he was intelligent, believed in progress, yeah. But Leo didn't believe in progress, and many other people also didn't believe in progress. Nietzsche didn't believe in progress. So, I think that postmodernity is something that people begin to understand what other people understood already in the 19th century. Right? Like Spangler. It's, uh, yeah, or, or, yeah. Or Heidegger. Yeah, no, no, it's the 20th century, but already what Leo and Flaubert and each, uh, so it was way back to the 19th century, so already it was clear. So the point is that we will, his, history is not teleological, 
uh, the role of uh, of the accidental is defining many, maybe all the aspects of our life. Uh, we're living in mediated, theoretical, secular society. Um, already in Valarme, uh, Kula De cannot extinguish the Hazal, and so on and so on. So, on. so it, it, it all, it was already very well known. But it was very well known maybe for avant-garde intellectual and artistic circles of the 9th century. And if people speak about postmodernity, they speak about the time, as, as with Platonism, yeah, as what was clear to small circles of uh, artistic, uh, intellectual elite uh, of the Western Europe in the 19th century began to be clear for everybody. Yeah, so that's so uh, actual looking from the perspective of artistic intellectual modernity, we are still in the nothing has changed. And we still don't know very well how to manage them. Yeah? I mean, all the modern problems are they were formulated, uh, also in relationship to art, in relationship to culture, in relationship to writing. At that time, they are still valid. Mm -hmm. So I think that real change, if, if you want a real change, real change was, of course, in the middle of 9th century. So it was collapse of Hegelianism, it was collapse of European idealism, it was beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and it was, of course, beginning of the cultural, intellectual modernity. Yeah. So uh, I guess, I mean, sort of piggybacking off of a, a, a an idea that's, you know, somewhat prevalent, at least in contemporary discourse, uh, Bruno Latour's uh, contention that we have never been modern. You're saying that we do live in modernity. Um, yes. We have, so modernity happened. We are still, in some sense, living within it, um, but we have never been postmodern. I guess, like, even accepting that, um, is perhaps the discourse or the idea, the self-conception of the the age that we're living in, the epoch that we're living in as postmodern. Is that discourse or that self-understanding at an end? Is the I mean, it's the discourse that began with, uh, like Charles Jenks in uh, in Scotland or uh, Francois Lyotard, Jean Francois Lyotard in in France. Is that is that coming to a close? Is there a sort of sense of that post, the discourse of postmodernism? No, 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 no. It, it, it's two different things. One different one thing is uh, of course uh, uh, what uh, Latour says. Uh, I don't know him personally, and uh, I don't know what he means. He means uh, we, are, we, we are not scientific, yeah? we, don't, we don't believe in scientific truths. Yeah? Basically, it's what, what he means. But I think that uh, he himself is, uh, is not modern, yeah? because modern is not to believe in any truths, including scientific truths. So as long as you believe in any kind of truth, you are not modern. Okay, and so. Uh, yes, with James and all the things, you know, uh, uh, if you look at the stylistic history, yeah, uh, uh, it, it, it was already described by Berkeley and other people, yeah, you have always beginning, or maybe even early, uh, maybe even beginning with Roman churches, yeah, if you want, yeah, but at least beginning with Renaissance, you have always these waves yeah, in the European st stylistic history. Yeah. So you have uh, Renaissance, clear cut forms, geometrical movement, certain kind of minimalism, certain kind of clarity, certain kind of intellectual transparency. And then you have Baroque, and you have Classes, and you have romanticism, and you have this, and you have that. And then we had um, 
uh, avant-garde at the beginning of 20th century, that lasted until, uh, let's say, 26, 27. And then you begin huge wave of even postmodernity, yeah? mm -hmm. uh, socialist realism, Nazi art, return to love, historicism, novecento in Italy. But it's all, all of that is uh, suppressed here yeah, because it's, 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 it's kind of, kind of bad here. Yeah. Totally want to forget it. And then after the World War II, you have a new wave of neo, a neo avant-garde that goes mm -hmm. until the 50s and 60s. 50s, 60s, at the beginning of the 70s. If you look at the 70s, or so 71, 72, uh, you, you, you uh, get new baroque, you get uh, grammatology, you get this, you get mm -hmm. that, it's a baroque text. So Delusian, probably. yeah, Delusian, yeah. but also Deridian, yeah. but also, but you have all these baroque things, yeah. You have a kind of uh, what is baroque things that that is uh, uh, conscious play with obscurity, with absence, with hidden, with different referentiality. Yeah. Loss of referentiality, yeah, some kind of intransparency, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, you have it uh, after you have it in 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 a period uh, immediately after the song. So you have this kind of waves, yeah. Uh, history of um, uh, cultural history of Europe, and uh, you have already that with Roman churches and Gothic churches. But okay, at least since. Uh, since uh, Renaissance, you have this kind of change between the change of waves of clarity, intellectual responsibility, mathematical models, scientific models, intransparency, and then intransparency, obscurity, absence, difference, uh, infinity. Yeah. yeah? And, and what, what, what is the version and the Lydia moment? Yeah? It is a moment where they take the structure is models that were based on the infinite, the idea of infinite system, and finite number of rules and finite number of moves, uh, moves in the, and make it infinite. Mm -hmm. And this is precisely what Romanticism mm -hmm. uh, made with uh, the Enlightenment. Yeah, the Enlightenment. It's what Baroque made with um, a Renaissance. So you have always absolutely the same practice, you have always the same procedure, and you always have the same written. It is simply how Western culture works. It's almost like Papernik's thesis of culture one, culture two, but in a Western context. But, <laughs> but it's not, it, no, no, it is not. It is what Papernik wrote about this culture one and culture two after he read Wilfred. After okay. he read Wilhelm Renaissance in Baroque, he applied that uh, to, the Soviet, uh, to the Soviet situation. So it is Wilhelm model. Wilhelm model works. Uh, if you apply it to this, or if you apply it to that. So, so if, there, if it's this sort of cyclical pattern of yeah. one and two. It's waves. Then there are waves. Waves. What marks modernity? versus yeah. antiquity um, as a kind of divide. Uh, if it is this kind of alternating measure, how is there like a specific break? Uh, you have all, you have this uh, waves, yeah? You have, uh, in, in Marxist, uh, in terms of Marxism, you have, of course, classical period of Marxism, which is period of clarity. Then you have period of obscurity, so Adorno and all that, yeah? and in transparency and infinity and profitism, so it begins actually at the turn of the century. It begins with the turn of the century in Germany specifically and especially, but also in Russia. You have very similar phenomenon. And then you get new period of clarity, maybe yeah, uh, after the war, so it's the same rhythm, and then you have kind of 
barokkal nézni. Ja. A tazát, so you, you, you have this waves everywhere. These waves are simply, and they are described, they are described already by uh, a German sociologist at the beginning, fancy it could define by Burton. So Burton described that. It's, it's a very easy mo model, it's, it's very clear, uh, uh, understanding why it happens here. Yeah. And I described that example of the star, so the example of the star was an answer to, to this model. So uh, the answer is that we have the underlying practice, you know, practice of modernization. Why we have this wave structure? We have this wave structure because if you have a new movement, as the first thought gesture is a revolutionary one, so everything is erased, what doesn't belong to that. And then you get this all back and integrate in your system, yeah? So that is how the Western system works. So you make a revolutionary break, like French Revolution is classicism, and so on and so on. And then, after you excluded everything and you created your own plan, you can ex include everything that was left behind under the conditions of the system. So you get all the antiquity back, you get uh, medieval practice back as a romanticism, uh, all the animal sexuality back, and so everything that was suppressed. Yeah, and, it was and, and the same was the Soviet Union. Yeah, we begin with black square, we begin with the clear, then the side, so on, until the surface, and then you get back everything the nationalism, the romanticism, and medi medieval here, Russian history, and everything, everything, everything. Mm. Yeah, if you look at... Uh, Neoclassicism. Yeah, everything, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you look at um, uh, clear examples like Eisenstein, yeah, you look at, uh, I don't know, uh, Potemkin, yeah, and you look at uh, Ivan, uh, Ivan the Terrible, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you see... The about, first or the second? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's a break. So, at the one hand, you, you have a, a radical, Eurasia of everything that doesn't belong to, to this moment. And then you have all this, you know, mystical, medieval, eternal, infinite problems back. Interesting. I guess as a related question to that, um, what is the, what would you say, I mean, and I think that this may be concerns the way that you situate yourself intellectually vis-a-vis -vis the West. Um, how would you say that, that the Soviet project relates to the period of modernity? And perhaps is, the, is there any sort of link between what is understood or perhaps wrongly in the West as post-modernity at all linked to either the collapse of the, the communist or historical Marxism um, and the sort of post-Soviet moment. Is there a sort of correspondence or correlation at all between the sort of post-Soviet, post-1989 moment and the kind of general onset of, of post-modernity? I, 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 I don't believe in post-modernity. I don't believe in, in post-Soviet situation. I think that uh, what we experience now, so the if you speak about the Kahneman. It's an intermediate moment uh, between two periods of wars and, and revolutions. Yeah. Uh, you, you have, we're living today in the illusion of peace and economy and markets and all that, yeah, like in the 19th century, yeah, before the First World War. Uh, so the long period of, um, in, in, in general, our, our mode of existence here today, I mean current mode of existence, is very similar to second half of the 19th century. You have mass culture, entertainment instead of culture, uh, terrorism, interest to sexuality, and Whatever you look at, yeah, the cult of celebrities, you know, uh, open markets, international trade, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, Manchester School, liberalism, now, but, now, Austrian but, yeah, neoliberalism. Yeah, absolutely, very similar. 
very similar in all the aspects. Yeah, press functional assembly, media functional assembly, very very similar. And that was a classical period. Yeah, between two worlds. Yeah, the two two catastrophes. Yeah? So we we go to the next one. And this has to do with uh, partial obliteration in our consciousness of the role of the state and direct military power. And it has to do with the fact that what we, uh, what we speak, when we speak about capitalism, yeah, we tend to think that we speak about certain kind of model. But uh, it is, of course, uh, not true. We speak simply about uh, American way of life that is installed in certain parts of, uh, of the world yeah, by American military power. Yeah? So it controls Europe, it controls certain areas in Latin America, certain areas in Asia, Japan. So, so the, the Western or economic system is simply uh, area of American military control, and that's it. Yeah, everything beyond that is not capitalism. Yeah, China is not capitalism. The Russia is not capitalism. And many other places are so not capitalism. So, as as far as America is able to control this part, you have capitalism. Or you have a system you name capitalism. You tend to speak about capitalism. All you have is one but it's, it's a some period of time, yeah, because, uh, you, you know, the military power of any state uh, cannot be kept forever, yeah. Other states also acquire military power. So it's, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's a bit like European countries in the 19th century before the rise of Germany, yeah. Now China, let's say, or something. So before the rise of Germany, everybody believed that it's about capitalism. Yeah, after the rise of Germany, <laughs> everybody understood it's about the war. And so uh, that, that, that what happens, yeah, and that what will happen in 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 a in a, in a foreseeable future. Yeah, that already begins to happen. So I think that the moment of the shift from this uh, secure, military secure uh, zone of stability and power, yeah, that the wrongly characterized capitalism is simply some kind of state imposed structure, or military imposed structure. That, that would be contested at some point in time by other structures, and that uh, starts a new period of wars, a new period of revolutions. Of course, mm -hmm. that always happens at the same time. And then we will say, okay, then you know, will remember Soviet Union, <laughs> so we will remember many other mm -hmm. phenomena. So the Soviet Union the never, never ended, it's just, never. it's just on hold. <laughs> Absolutely, because it's the same, it's the same, I don't know, wave structure, yeah? So we're now in a certain kind of period of intermediate peace, security, military imposed security, based on military supremacy of uh, American, American army. But if, if the supremacy will be put in question, and that, that can happen, yeah? That's mm -hmm. happened with Rome, that happened with many other things. Then we will be going to the new system of insecurity, where the state and military power acquires a relevance uh, it had, uh, let's say, in the first half of the century, yeah. and and so we will be in a completely different political surrounding, yeah, political context. Yeah, context change. I guess um, I'd like to perhaps close with two questions. Um, I'll, I'll do them one at a time, though. Um, yeah. 
the the first one um, relates to this theme. I guess it's posed somewhat by postmodernity, or what's I what's thought of as postmodernity, um, but which again might just be a sort of repetition of an earlier pattern. Um, there's the old question uh, of what Hegel identified as the end of art and the end mm. of history, the end of philosophy. Mm. Um, Marx seemingly reversed reversed this and said that no, actually, you know, bourgeois society is not the end of history, um, but rather uh, the contradiction that industrial the industrial revolution threw it into perhaps provides the groundwork for the beginning of a truly human social history. Mm -hmm. um, more recently, uh, and you trace this out somewhat uh, with uh, reference to Alexander Krojev, mm -hmm. um, the end of history, you mentioned that this is tied in with uh, obviously uh, unnamed, but uh, Fukuyama, yeah. the end of history, uh, the last man, the Nietzschean last man, yeah. which is directly from Krojev. Yeah. Um, but also then in, in the realm, in the sphere of art, we're, I mean, we're exploring a series of panels on the idea of the death of art. You, we have writers like uh, Arthur Dante or Greg Horowitz mm. who have this thesis of the, the end of art. Um, they themselves understand it to be roughly in line with what Hegel, or related to what Hegel was talking about, but somewhat different. Um, the sort of crisis that it's about. I'd like to perhaps, I mean, maybe maybe if you could relate this to Alexander Krojev as a kind of intermediary figure between, I mean, Hegel on the one hand, yeah. uh, you mentioned Solovyov uh, yeah. as a, a central figure for Krojev, and then Fukuyama at the other end, but then also a, a similar end of art narrative yeah. uh, with uh, with reference to Hegel, then I would put in the middle between between uh, between Hegel and Dante or you know other end of art theorists. Um, there's the Soviet uh, aesthetician uh, Mikhail Lifshitz, yeah. um, who in his philosophy of uh, of in the philosophy of art of Karl Marx um, wrote towards the end that the only slogan of a Marxist aesthetics or philosophy of art is that art is dead, yeah. long live art. In the same way that Marx had written uh, that the revolution is dead, long live the revolution, yeah. Platypus's own slogan is the left is dead, long live the left. Um, so I, I guess like in this sort of, insofar as Marxism believed that the end of history that Hegel identified was actually going to be the beginning of true human history, or, or the end of philosophy, called the culmination of philosophy in, in Hegel was going to be making the world philosophical, making the world artistic, the end of art becoming mm -hmm. uh, art into life. Um, is there a way, perhaps, that Danto and Fukuyama are right, that history and art have ended in this kind of weird, non-emancipatory way? Is there any truth to their to their diagnoses, and if so, I mean, what does that say about the sort of truth or untruth of, of Marx's uh, belief? I mean, it can can art and can history perish in conservative times? Mm, no, I don't think so. But let, let, let us look at Koshev, yeah? I suggested Koshev, let us talk this out. So Koshev formulated this uh, you know, dictum about the uh, end of history yeah, and, 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 and really kind of influential way, yeah, for, for French philosophy at least, and the repros, uh, Agamben repros, uh, everybody repros. So if you look at what he's saying, he's saying following thing. So we have two types of desire. One is desire consumption, and the second is desire of desire. So we want to be desirable, and we want to our desire to be desirable. One 
set of designs for animal designs. We have also the designs that connect up to animal growth. The second desire, desire to be desired, is specifically human. It, as it is says, anthropogenic design. So what, what is different between us and the animals is that uh, we want to be loved here, yeah? and want to be admired, we want to be desired. What actually uh, animals not necessarily want here, yeah? at least that what his assumption. And the point he makes is that we achieved the goal of this being desirable through the contemporary state. Because contemporary state likes us in all our forms. So there is no, uh, let's say, uh, uh, there is no desires that are not recognized. Yeah? We have a situation of full recognition. Yeah? And that, that situation after the end of history. In that situation, if we have the situation of uh, total recognition of all our desires, then we don't have them. We don't have any more desires to be desirable. We have only animal desires, and humans cease to be humans and turns into human animals. Yeah, that is last man. Yeah. So last man is Koshet himself. Everybody else is the animal. Yeah, because we have only animal desires for for hunger, for sex, yeah, all the things. Human desires, historical desires, are already all satisfied. Okay, if we have this model, then it's obvious that this model, in itself, it's a kind of utopia, at least on first level, at two levels. First of all, we don't have universal homogeneous state, uh, because such a state should be a world state. And Kasha mm -hmm. says that time and again. So as far is that a departure from Stalin, by the way? I mean, insofar yes, as the, this socialism in one country, the state. I will publish the part of that. There is a manuscript. Maybe to, maybe you can help publish it, because it's still not published. Uh, it's a manuscript that he wrote in Russian in 3940, and they posted uh, in two places. One place was uh, Soviet embassy in Paris that was still open at that time under German occupation because there was no war. Uh, between Germany and Russia at that time. And, and the copy he deposed in the private archive of Bartai. The copy that he deposed in the Soviet embassy probably perished because it was a big fire in you know, and probably was burned. The second one uh, was uh, uh, that was deposed uh, in, in private archive of Bartai is still there and was never published. And it's most extensive and uh, by far the best uh, presentation, a systematic presentation with philosophy. Because he never made the presentation uh, in French, you know, yeah, it's all text of his students. So it's not, in, it's not in French at all? It's in Russian. It's only in Russian. Okay. It's only in Russian. And it should be translated, it should be uh, translated, but it never was. Yeah, it's good uh, I went, I didn't have a lot of time, but I went through this manuscript. And part of it is discussion of Stalinism. And he says that Stalinism is a talus and pinnacle of human de development. And that Stalin realized the promise of uh, Plato and Christophe philosophy. In our time, because he is somebody who can do everything and explain everything. It's something that Zizhko also used, actually, later. So the idea that Stalin, that big difference from Hitler and any other leader of that time, is that he always meticulously explains theoretically all his decisions. Yeah? He it's never not just his will. It's not like the, the Fuhrer's no. will. He, <laughs> he, he never says, it's because it seems to me. He never <laughs> says, it's because I have an inspiration. He never says it's because I'm part of German nation or Italian nation. He always says, you know, I came to this conclusion because of this and that. And then you have a lengthy explanation, Marxist terms, and whatever you move. 
this is the paradox that you're talking about. And it's this paradox? He, he explains how the left and right are both deviationists uh, and how the center yeah. is the correct. Yeah. Unfortunately, I wrote uh, Communist Postcript before reading Kozak. But basically, it's the same idea. Yeah, I came to the same idea. I speak about the domination of the language. Yeah, uh, in Stalinist Russia, uh, Kozak speaks absolutely about the same, he, and also speaking about Platonic Aristotle. So the coincidence is, is is really incredible. I really absolutely would like to do to to read that before and to to be able to refer to that. So he speaks about complete domination of language and Lugas in Stalinist Russia and this necessity that everybody, including Stalin himself, feels to explain himself with all the decisions and decisions and he believes that this compulsion is, is, is what actually uh, Plata in Aristotle's head in mind. So, for him, the end of history was Stalin and not bourgeois society, because bourgeois society was still uh, not uh, ethicistic society, so still not society controlled by the state. And Kozhev uh, was Hegelian in a sense that he believed in a universal world state that gives a place for everybody, for every individual. And recognize every, every individual. Then, and uh, he, he also understood that, the problem of recognition is very tricky. And he's different from Hegel and Marx here. You, I mean, you, you write that for him it's, it's Solovyovian. He is different. It's different. It's infinite. It doesn't. It's not just a stage along the way that it is. Yeah, but uh, I don't. Uh, I developed that next. Uh, in, uh, probably you know that I made. Uh, I found it also in, in the archives. Uh, of the Detect National, uh, the photographic archive of the uh, I made the first exhibition of part of it, and, and uh, I, showed, I showed it now in Politico in Paris. And so I will develop that uh, further. And it's undoing He believes that the one hand that desire, desire can come to the end in in the state, so we can go into the animal mode of existence, or we can de kind of disconnect this desire to be designed from the historical process in terms of achieving certain concrete goals and to concentrate on the problem of self representation, so to say. So, desire to be desirable and desire of recognition is not 100% historically determined. And it's precisely when I speak about self-design, yeah, if you read this text, and that is why I think that art is still there and will be there in foreseeable future. Because the problems of self-presentation and desire of recognition, this problem is not a way. Yeah? It's still there. So, for example, when I come into the world, I am not recognized. To be able to create a recognition of myself, to be able to be desirable, yeah, I have to write something, to paint something, to say something, or to play something. Yeah? Otherwise, I am described by the state only. Yeah? So, what is art? Art is self-empowerment. Art is a way how the individual is able to create conditions of his or her own recognition and of desire to sign. Yeah? This Radical individualism of art seems to be a social at the first glance. At the second glance, is not a social but exemplary. Because in our society, an artist uh, exemplifies 
the fate of every individual. In fact, in this strategy of obtain recognition and and and, 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 and yeah. so on. Yeah, I mean, there's the disc the the problem of the modern artist that you lay out is the the antithesis or the the contradiction of of searching for an audience. There's a sort of disconnect between the artistic individual and his public. Yeah, but but it's a wrong at the end uh, at the be so what what. What is the point of break here? The, re the relationship of artist with the audience is understood by, by many artists in an extremely traditional way as a relationship of coming to common aesthetic ground. Uh, so I, I, I painted uh, I paint an image, yeah, I paint a uh, a painting, and then the, I don't know, so somebody comes and says, oh, how beautiful, how wonderful, how admirable, how I love it, yeah, I really love it. Well, that is a classical relationship between artists and, and public. This uh, relationship doesn't exist anymore. It's over. Because consensus is over, ideological consensus is over, intellectual consensus is over, and aesthetic consensus is over. It's the market. It, it's no, price. no, it's not the market. There is a market, yeah. But there is different uh, and overlooked relationship. This overlooked relationship is the following one. I painted something, and somebody comes and said, okay, Great, he did it. I do something different, more successful. Mm -hmm. So, what happens is not that I admire the product of the world of the other, but I use the same techniques, the same procedure, and the same strategies for my own practice of my own self representation. We have a different relationship, much deeper and much more stimulating relationship between audience and, and the artist. And that was described already in Russian formalism by Russian avant-garde the beginning of the 20th century. It's not a, produ a product that are uh, uh, important there. It's productive process itself. It's techniques, strategies, and productive processes that can be used by everybody in society, that are given by the art mm -hmm. society. Everybody in our society makes, uh, 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 I don't know, so it's like in Facebook uh, make, uh, makes a sign. How I don't know that I should make it this way? Only because I saw hundreds, meanwhile, installations with images, self-made images, videos, texts, yeah. Every analysis of contemporary self-presentation shows that this self-presentation is made on the examples that are delivered by Caterpillar. And look, people going, millions of people going to exhibitions of Caterpillar. I know, everywhere are the museums of Caterpillar. What? Because they look at that and they, not because they admire it, but because they imitate it. Relationship of the audience to the contemporary art is not a relationship of admiration, but it's a relationship of imitation. And that many people do not understand that. And the same is relationship to the left of you. The problem is not, or, the, or the, 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 the relationship is not that I look at the revolutionary leader and I follow him. No, that doesn't matter. I look at the revolutionary leader and I begin to imitate him. If you look at the contemporary uh, liberational movements all over the world, 
they all are very concrete, concentrate on the individual problems of the individual spaces, of individual contexts, but they imitate the same international procedures. You go to Borneo, you go to Peru, I travel a lot, yeah, you go to Korea, yeah, and so on. Uh, problems are specific, situations are specific, status of recognition are specific, uh, liberational uh, struggles are specific, more of the techniques are universal. You see uh, the same practices, the same uh, procedures that we see everywhere, even if the situation is very special. So the subject of such a practice doesn't share your goals, doesn't share your intentions, but share your techniques and strategies if he wants to be a revolutionary or he wants to be an artist or he wants to be left. Yeah? He wants to be left not in general, but he wants to be left here and now. And he looks at what other people do if they want to be left. And imitates that under specific conditions of the situation he is in. Yeah? And everybody does. Everyone does it also contemporary Russia, yeah. Everybody is left in contemporary Russia. Everyone. What does it mean? Now, the people look at what is what would happen in the 60s, what would happen there, what would happen in Russia itself, in the 20s and so on, and imitate that under specific conditions of their own existence. And everybody does. So you have now the relationship not of following and admiration, not a party situation or another situation of traditional leadership and audience, but you have the practice of imitation that is very efficient, that goes all over the world. And it's simply a different relationship. It's not the end of anything, it's just a change of, of relationship between artist or revolutionary and the audience or, uh, or the collective, but, um, but so it is, yeah. And I don't see any problem. I think it's, it's better, actually. I like it more. So, art becomes technique. Um, it was always. It, or, so, it's a, by the, the Shklovsky and yeah. idea it's that it's, it's Yeah, it's... And that's the sort of permanent structural condition. It's or formal. Yeah. Formal For condition, yes. Yeah. Um, and it never goes away. But I, I guess... Um, and a revolution is the same. So, I mean... To return to a point you made earlier, though, um, you said that, like, for this sort of self-recognition or the uh, the desire for recognition and the achievement of that um, for Kojev, for the end of history for Kojev, uh, art must continue. So, for history to end, art or self-design yeah. must continue. Must continue. Um, but I wonder if art or art in this situation is art as we understand it in the classical sense is sort of divorced from life, the sort of classical antithesis no, of... No, it's not. So, I mean, art would cease to be art as a sort of separate phenomenon from, from life's, life. So, I mean, perhaps in that way, in that sense, art too would end in in its sort of pre-unrealized pre form. No, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, the relationship between art and life is not a kind of relationship that can be, uh, I don't know, aufgehoben, yeah, in, mm -hmm. in Hegelian sense. Yeah, so, so sublated. Yeah, yeah sublated. Yeah, you can do that. So if you do art, so if you create a system of self-presentation, uh, self-stylization, and, and, and design, design, there is always something that you exclude. It is something that you exclude from, from your own biography. It is something that is excluded in a sense of uh, people who don't do that, and so on and so on. There is always something excluded. Every, every creation of every form yeah, means that something is excluded. Everything that is excluded from the form is life, yeah? uh, by definition. Yeah? And that means that Opposition between art and life is permanently reproduced, yeah? as also permanently reproduced 
the desire to turn life into art and art into life. Yeah, so exchange the places. So to expand what is art into life and to use as a context of life, uh, of art, what was excluded on the further level. So you have uh, this uh, yeah, formal formalist model uh, of technical understanding of art as form giving. Yeah? Every form giving, every technique of form giving, and form giving to yourself, or society linking, or practice, always is exclusive, always excludes something. There is never ever all inclusive art models. And that means that even if you create an example of the Soviet Union, only uh, paying a price or excluding everything else outside its borders, yeah, what Stalin actually did. It was an artwork, but everything else was life, if you want to. Everything that was not Soviet Union was life. Soviet Union was art, everything else was life. And actually, the West was always uh, the understood it at a place of life. Yeah? Yeah. And, and Stalin had that uh, phrase of like, life is becoming better, it's becoming more beautiful. Yeah, but it's precisely, <laughs> it's not life anymore. Yeah? <laughs> you know, if, you, if you look at the anti Stalinist, I, I, I quote them in Communist uh, Postscript. Um, what, what, what was anti-Stalinist kind of writing from Bataille to, 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 to Orwell and so on? It's always about life, about dirtiness, sexual deviation, strange love, yeah, uh, whimsiness, yeah, and so on and so on. Yeah. Who is a, who is a, uh, uh, hero of Cold War in the Western imagination is James Bond. Yeah, so many women, high life, yeah, cocktails. You know, I I I think this opposition was formulated very clear uh, in Yinichka. Yeah, it was all that. It's it's precisely between ideology, art. Yeah, she she's artwork, and he is seducer. Yeah, he wants to bring, he wants to seduce art into life. Corrupt her. Yeah? Life is corruption, basically. So, so Western, the West was always perceived in Soviet Union as a place of desire, corruption, illicit love, yeah, uh, satisfaction, consumption, and so forth, in as an opposition to to art and production. Production of and, and soft mm -hmm. basically soft production, not um, production, because they did produce it. To produce the self. Yes. So, so you have the self production of the one as an artwork of the one hand, and dirty satisfaction and corruption of the other. Thing. That, that, and that is life. So you always reproduce this relationship between art and life. You never can uh, sub sublimate it. it. It simply doesn't happen. Okay, um, so just kind of, so just briefly, uh, you don't see any sort of homology between. Uh, somebody like Kozhev and somebody like Mikhail Lifshitz, uh, the artist at Long Live Art moment. No, no, I, th I think that uh, Lifshitz, uh, uh, Lifshitz was a kind of uh, John idealist or uh, something like that. Very Lukashian, obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah. very Lukashian, very, very much so. Nice guy, but you know, uh, 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 very much anti avant-garde. Oh, yeah, very, very. Uh, Anti-modernist. Anti-modernist, yeah. and you know, I'm pro-avant-garde and pro-modernist through and through. So I think that uh, the role of art as a role of revolution, that the role of art in contemporary world is never ever uh, sublated, never ever ended, uh, and that you always have this kind of Opposition between what is revolution and what is reactionary, what is always the same. Uh, permanent paradox. Yeah, it's permanent paradox. Uh, okay, so, uh, so just like in closing, then the last question I'll ask is, I mean, you you mentioned this uh, both in an essay um, on participatory art that you recently uh, wrote, uh, as well as in Gesamtkunstwerk uh, Stalina, uh, you where you trace the, the trajectory of uh, 
Richard Wagner um, yeah. uh, following the 1848 revolutions, yeah. where he writes uh, his piece on the, the future work of art, or the artwork of the future. Um, and you describe it as a sort of trying to, trying to achieve the, it's a reaction to political failure. Yeah. And it's an attempt to, to reach the, the political aims mm -hmm. of the 1848 revolutions, communism, etc., yeah. by aesthetic means. Yeah. Insofar as you, you regard um, Stalinism as a sort of total work of art, mm -hmm. as its own sort of Gesamtkunstwerk, um, do you feel that perhaps it was a sort of attempt to reach the the political aims of the failed 1917 revolution in the sense that it was just socialism in one country. It was not, it was a political failure in terms of its own self-defined goals, yeah. the failed world revolution. Uh, was Stalinism perhaps uh, in sublating the avant-garde, as you argue, um, a, an aesthetic response to political failure? Yeah, yeah. it was. I think so. It was, uh, uh, like many other movements at that time, like so fascism, uh, Nazi, national socialism is a different thing. But you see that very clearly in the development of futurism to late the Mussolini regime, with the same logic in the same way. Of course, yeah. You begin to exercise uh, at the moment you, you, you know it doesn't go for at the, at, at, at the moment, he understood the revolution would never take place. Yeah? He began to aestheticize what already happened and turns out into the art of that, That's normal. So that's what we are doing. Uh, and on the other hand, you know, the art uh, became more and more Stalinist, yeah, if you want. Yeah? I described that in the politics of installation. Yeah? Mm -hmm. so the, you have a self-empowered of artist and uh, manipulative and defining character of artist in relationship to art space, the social space, to the degree you never believed yeah, before in its time with your voice. Yeah. You have now people like Jimievsky, yeah, a lot of people coming from the East, yeah, who have this kind of totalitarian play. Yeah, and, and so, uh, all of the uh, a productive part of our time, an interesting part of our time, is of course a sign of failure of a, a total project, yeah, an attempt to synthesize this project on a kind of uh, uh, artistic territory. Yeah. And of course it begins with one and some, some people come back. Uh, in, in, in a certain way, of course, uh, and so uh, Lipschitz and Lukács have some truths in what they're saying about Marxism. That Marxism had some kind of, uh, you know, intrinsic aesthetic play. Because if you say that uh, from the beginning, yeah. and so it's, 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 it's already kind of broken relationship. Lipschitz even argues that um, Marx's aesthetic understanding informed his political yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I want to say, that uh, I think there is one very central point is that, that is uh, a notion of alienation. So if you look at the notion of alienation, the difference between alienated and non-alienated work is basically the difference between uh, industrial and artistic work. So if you say that uh, you want to end the alienation, then it's very much sounds like you want to, 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 to turn everything in, everybody an artist, everything is artwork. Yeah. And it was especially obvious, of course, in the, in the general context, the German arts, you know, idealism, post in time as, uh, and this over-evaluation of the aesthetic, yeah, characteristic for Schelling and Hegel and all of them, yeah, after Kantian critics, yeah, they, they started with the third critique, uh, uh, already sharing this uh, with, mm -hmm. with our attempt to, to, to come to 
unity back in you know, schools and institutions. Uh, it's lost the visual unity, consciousness, or aesthetics. So yeah, you, you can read very easily read uh, Marx as a context and of that, of course, what, uh, what uh, Lipschitz, for example, did. But uh, I rather uh, sympathize with later Marx, with disbelief and collapse of this idea, with insight in, uh, as I say, uh, irreconcilable character of the social division, impossibility of the terms of the artwork. And artistic practices that are not unifying, but exemplary, yeah? that do not try to include other things yeah? as, as, as a, as a uh, material yeah? in, in the project, but to offer an example that everybody can follow and actually follows. Yeah. So it's a different strategy, but I think it's more, it's strategy of course based on the insight of certain failure, of failure of certain projects. But the point is that the rise out of it seems to me to be okay enough, yeah. So that I, I, I feel myself very comfortable in being non-pessimistic about contemporary art. Okay, um, I think we can we can probably wrap it up there. Um, I'd like to thank you for uh, granting the interview. Um, it's a shame you won't be in New York for the uh, panels on art, but uh, would it be all right if I would it be all right if I put you in contact with um, some of our members in? Uh, Germany, uh, perhaps for organizing. Yes, us. of course, because I will be in Weimar for a long time, from the middle of January to the end of June. Oh, perfect. And so I will be at Bauhaus University. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and for this, for for the coming semester, for this And so, yeah, I I can I can come to Berlin. Okay, cool. Um, yes, thank you again. And yeah, yeah we'll end it here.